Alex Norris, a little bit of history. You were one of the first IVF babies. Yeah, 1984. Well, 1983 it would have been. Um, that's that's how I was conceived, very early days. So mine, like many people, is an NHS story, and that's and that's how I came to be. Gosh, it must have been incredible for your parents to go through that. Yeah, well, it's, it, it was because of my father's illness. Um, my dad had blood cancer uh, over a period of six years, and this was in the middle of it. So in order for, for them to conceive, they wanted to, to have a second child with my big sister. Um, so they, they went through this relatively novel process and, and I came out the other end of it. So again, a wonderful thing for, for us, something that wouldn't have happened in, in times before. And so something I feel a real profound connection to. You mentioned your dad's blood cancer. You lose your dad when you're two. Do you have memories of your dad? Yeah, fleeting, kind of like photos in your head of little moments, but very small. So it was just before my third birthday. Um, so obviously you, you keep the memories alive more by stories with your family and, and whatnot. But it, it's something that, you know, it was 35 years a couple of days ago. And that's the sort of thing that kind of stays with you a bit. What did your mum and dad do? So they, at the, at the time um, of, of my birth, they ran a pub. Um, you know, my dad was from Sunderland. He'd run away to sea in his late teens. Uh, Mum was a dancer originally, danced in carnivals in Brazil, an incredible professional career in that sense. And then they met on a cruise ship where Mum was an entertainment officer um, and then came off the, the, the ships. I was going to call it boats and my mum would have uh, put in a complaint to Ofcom. Um, and, but in, so they came off the, the ships then to, to, to run a pub and then my dad was, was poorly and, and that was the end of that process. After he passed away, they, they then sold the pub and we moved back to, to Manchester with my grandparents. Gosh. So you, your dad dies just before your third birthday and then she, your mum sells the pub. Just talk us through your earliest memories from that period. And that was a hard, that was a hard time. Mum had two young kids. Um, her skills, which she, you know, trained for, you know, had, had come ahead of her, perhaps her education at school. She's caught up on her GCSEs now, which is very proud of, but didn't leave with very many O-levels. So she had to find work that she could do to, to raise two kids. Uh, so she went into childminding because that was something that you could take your kids to. Um, and so my memories are watching mum work very hard to keep a roof over our heads, to be aware that, you know, it, it, I don't, you don't want to be too much kind of like black and white footage about this stuff, but that things were challenging. We didn't have an awful lot of margin for error. We didn't have lots of money. Um, and that we kind of had to pull together and, uh, and to be together. Um, and then watching her go to night school after working long days to build her skills and to do better at work. And that, that was the story of our, of our life kind of changing. That's something I remember. And again, quite a profound formative experience for me from my childhood. Your mum sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah, she's tough, yeah. So she had to do, I'm, I'm very aware of the sacrifices she made for me and my sister. Um, and then, you know, she loves, she loves what I do. I think so. I, I, I get a kick out of that. I feel like it perhaps it was a decent investment. My sister's wonderful as well, you know, we're a great family. And so, you know, it was a very hard time, you know, and it's not now. I'm conscious of that. And the thing of having gone through that is that I'm not misty eyed about it. You'd never want to go back to it, but also you don't want to forget it either. And that's very much why I chose the kind of what I did with my career because to, to help families like mine. What do you feel that you went without that other kids seemed not to? Or perhaps she was mm. so good at managing things that she managed to disguise any of that? Yeah, I mean, you, you're aware of difference, whether it's holidays, whether it's clothes. But we, you know, we valued other things, you know, and I was aware. Because the thing you're most aware you didn't have was two parents. And, but the way in which we were together, you know, our house was a house full of love. The three of us were very close. We still are. So as a result, you know, you didn't feel like you missed stuff in that way. So, it, you know, and those sorts of things outweigh obviously the material things, which is why I've never been excited about the material stuff, obviously then through the rest of my life. Some people who lose parents early on, there are longer term repercussions to, to that. Um, people always say kids are very resilient, <laughs> yeah. but actually as you grow older, then losing a parent very young, do you think there are, it's affected you psychologically long term? Well, you know, I think in the sense that you carry it with you, of course it must do. I was very young. Yes. So perhaps for my sister who's older, it would have a more, you know, a, a more direct impact. Um, 
you know, you're aware, as you say, as, of a child of that difference, and it's natural to feel a sort of sense of, of, of a gap and loss. But there's there's definitely a phenomenon that certainly as as, me, as boys get to the age of their fathers, which I'm about now, that can be a moment of kind of reflection or, or whatever. So I, the honest thing is I don't really know because you don't always recognise it in yourself, but you know, there's no way that something like that happens and it doesn't leave a kind of an, an indelible impact on it. That's extraordinary. So, so, so your dad, when he died, was about... You'd be pretty much exactly the same age as I, I am now, yeah. How old? 37. So you think, yeah, as you say, it's hard not to then see parallels, you know, in, in your own life. And then to, I feel very young. I feel like, you know, I feel like my life is in front of me. So to think that that would be that, then that, of course, gives you an incredible sense of softness. Now, Alex, you, whatever your mum does or your teachers, turns out you're really clever. Child, you're a clever child. Yeah. And um, when does this become apparent? We'll uh, we'll go on to explore why I'm asking you this very lovely question about you being a really clever kid in a second. But when does it transpire that you're really smart? Well, through I was always good at school, and you know it was mum instilled that thing in us that we were going to go to school, we we're going to work hard. You know, we, ours wasn't a family where people had gone to university, but that we could have those opportunities if we worked hard and that education would be our way of building the best lives for ourselves. And, and obviously we saw that replicated because that's what she was doing at night, at night school. So, and then you can, when you're younger, you just, you know, you know you've got a flair for certain things and that things are going well and that your teachers, you know, are positive about your parents even and want and perhaps you to, to push you for different opportunities. So that's, you know, you sort of started to get that sense. So. Did you sit an exam? Because you end up at private school <laughs> yes. at the age of... 11. 11. Yeah. So you're at your, 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 pr your primary state school, your local primary yeah, state mother. school. And then wh what happens? Yeah, so the, again, it, so mine is where I'm from was atypical in the sense that we still have the 11 plus. So we were used to taking exams. And then as part of that kind of circuit almost of exams, um, the school said, why don't you sit this exam for uh, the private school, Manchester Grammar School? Um, so I did, and there's two parts, and you know, you get through the first part that most people do, and then the, you get a call after the second part saying, well, actually, we want to offer you a place. And it was quite, it was an academic exercise in the sense that we couldn't afford to go. And then they said, but that's, yeah, you can't afford to go, so you won't have to pay. So we've got free place, free everything. Um, and then so suddenly you realise, actually, you are going to this school, which is a little, very different to where you expected to go. What's it like when you get turn up there on your first day? Do they provide a, a, a uniform for you? Yeah. What's is it yeah, a posher uniform? No, no, that's the sort of stuff. It, it was. It's still Manchester. Yeah. Uh, you know. So it, it, I don't want to start giving like Harry Potter vibes out of it. That was first day at Parliament rather than first day at school. <laughs> so, but when I say the school paid for everything, they paid for everything: travel, uniforms, all in basically the desire to try and, to make you not feel different. And actually, that, was, that wow. was done very well. That's good. You know, of our year, there were 30, there were 30 of 200 that would be in my situation. I couldn't tell you who they were. Um, we would all know who we were, but I couldn't. So the difference was felt more in the, you know, everyone knows French. You know, I've never spoken a word of French in my life. And suddenly all these, these children at 11 could do it. And so the differences became quite obvious that the, perhaps the academic backgrounds were much stronger. But, but as a child, you were, you know, you were, met, you were just one of the crowd, really. Did you board? No, no, it's no. a day school. Day school. Yeah. I don't know if it is possible to sort of compare the quality of education or class size at all. Do, does anything strike you as when you went from your, your primary school to, to posh school? What struck you most? Well, you, you can obviously, you know, I spend a lot of time at schools now, so you do compare. Um, and demographically, it's very different, certainly in ethnicity wise. It was a, 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 it's lots of white. Yeah, white, white children, frankly, than we see in, in my community. So that's an obvious difference. But again, you know, it's a school with uniforms, but with, you know, older traditions on the wall and all that sort of stuff. You know, was, school started in, in 1515 and all that. There'd be a few more kind of arcane customs, founders days and things like that. What's that? Well, that, special days that were that you go to the cathedral to talk, you know, to celebrate the foundation of the school. I mean, I know all sorts of places have rituals. So it was just, yeah, it, it, it wasn't, it was hard to say it wasn't that different because, I, you know, I, I didn't have anything to compare it to. But the number one thing is from straight away, there was an expectation you're going to do really well and that, you know, you were going to work really hard and that you're, you're almost on a conveyor belt and that you yourself will have to jump off the side if you don't want that conveyor belt to take you somewhere really good. 
and it's, it, you, you can't help but think looking back why isn't that the case for every child and what how different could that be for everyone if that was the case for everybody you know there'll be some people watching this because, I mean, to be honest, I'm thinking it a bit because of <laughs> that last Labour government, the, the Blair government, it scraps the assisted yeah, place. Yeah. Is that sort of what we're yeah, talking about? Yeah, yeah which was yeah. to give working class yeah. kids, a few, admittedly, um, the chance to go to private school. And there'll be some people thinking, why did they scrap that? Look at Alex. He benefited from that. Yeah, I mean, the school straight away started fundraising and replaced it pretty quickly. So I, I don't think it was it was a dead loss. I mean, they may write to be saying differently, but that was my recollection. But it shouldn't be by exception. You know, the idea that for a number of children chosen at the age of 11, based on their academic ability, they should be exposed to better opportunities than those who weren't, that to me is just basically wrong. And that our answers have to be, how do we raise up everybody rather than, you know, how do we pick out a few and give them better chances? That just seems fundamentally unfair to me. When I was at school, I often didn't go to school on things like wear your own clothes to school day, because obviously, I went, uh, well, not obviously, but I, I went to comp, but, um, but we were poor. Um, and now I look at how, what schools do today. So it's not just the occasional wear your own clothes school day, it's like book day, it's uh, proms, it's, it's like things that, yeah. I mean, I, and I thought, when I see this, I thought, God, I, it wouldn't have been one day a year. I, I, I'd have had to miss quite a few days a year. Does any of that worry you? Because it sounds like your private school made sure that yeah. nobody knew. Yeah, I, can't, I look at some of the days now on social media, I don't relate to them at all. I know many of them are quite new anyway, yes, since 20 true. years ago, but, but actually in reality, that wasn't our experience at all. You, you wore the same school uniforms through the school and then you wore basic Marks and Spencer suits when you, or I did anyway, when you, when you got into, into sick form. So yeah, that, that. So there was never, did you have, did you have to do like posh things like proms and stuff at private school? Do they have things like that, that you wouldn't have a comp, that you wouldn't have had a comprehensive school then or are, are there no, things? No. We had something in sick form, but not, yeah, you know, but at no. that point you didn't really care about it, about much. Yeah. The difference was in holidays. You know, you were you were you know you were aware that other people did you know had foreign holidays, for example. That ah, was, and you didn't. And that wasn't the sort of thing that that we did. Well, every other year, you'd, yeah. you'd do something. So, but again, you know, those you, you were aware of them, but weren't something that was a constant feature or made you feel that actually, you know, that, that less about yourself as a result. Your it's, it's really interesting to talk about your your background. I just want to do one question about um, politics because I I know your your seat a bit, and there's this. Um, perception that all towns are read well and all cities are mm. sort of urban graduate labour but actually of the of all the nottingham seats you have what we'll term a significant white working class element yes. in that seat tell me how that does it feel different from the other nottingham seats why does it matter to you yeah i mean mine mine is i would say a town seat but within a city we've got bullwell it's a market town um, and then the rest of the constituency radiates off that. So a lot of the things that characterise the 2019 election, but also the ones before, we've got that. The thing that probably stopped us from being different, you know, we, our, I say I boarded the red wall, um, mainly so I can sleep at night, or I sometimes say I'm in the red wall when I want to be able to speak with expertise. So I, is it, it's possibly a fungible boundary there, um, but we've got all the benefits of the big city in the sense that we've got really, really good public transport. We do have connections to big employers. So whilst we don't have all the features that make people say, well, actually, this has not worked for us. We voted a certain way for a long time. We're not going to do it again. So that, you know, that, that I think is the difference for us. I think it's still quite a big journey to win back those voters that, that left the Labour Party at the last election. Yeah. How I'm, far along the road are you? Well, we've made, I think we've made considerable strides. It's sometimes hard in politics to know whether you're doing better or the other side are doing worse, because they definitely are. And that can mask things. You know, you can't live and die by polling because it can, it can give you reasons to not change. 2019 was awful to be told by my neighbours that they didn't think that we spoke for them anymore, that they looked at us particularly at a national level and thought that we didn't love our country, that we didn't value work strongly enough. You know, those are really hard messages to hear. They weren't unique to 2019. We'd been hearing them for a while and perhaps we hadn't listened. Um, so it is better now. You know, we have those conversations on the door and people recognize change. They want to know that we're for real though, because it's been two years and that's it. You know, they want to see from us 
that we're interested in talking about their issues rather than just the issues that we you know that we're particularly passionate about and they want they want to know just like everybody else that they're going to be better off with us and that this isn't some sort of you know crusade that's not relevant to their life and it's getting there it isn't there yet and you know and until we land that certainly with people in communities like mine we won't make the progress that we want to alex norris fascinating life story and interesting on politics too thank you very much indeed <laughs> alex norris <laughs>